Okay. Yeah. First of all, I'm, I know I'm in that. Um, so um, this is a more uh, technical stuff. Usually, you see here, and um, as a contrast, so today there will be maybe just a little bit of technical stuff. Uh, then we will talk about anything else. So uh, everything around testing, planning, managing, uh, reporting. So this will be everything about this. So therefore, the title is managing security testing. So. Some, some words about me. So um, I'm working for the uh, company CSPI uh, based in Cologne. It's an American company. Um, so it means we have um, um, subsidiaries in, in UK, in Germany, and USA. And here we are a system integrator. That means that we are partnering with vendors and uh, providing security services. And one of the security services is security management, of course, and plantation testing. So. And um, I'm working in the security area or in the IT areas yeah, for more than 20 years, and uh, mainly in the security area. So I started with uh, network security, and um, right now I'm, I'm working in the area of security management. That means that we are introducing security management systems into big companies or also smaller companies, also performing analysis, conducting tests, this could be paper-based, this could be process workflows, but also technical testing. So uh, beyond this, then, of course, we are also consulting companies in setting up and security architecture for the whole company. OK. So I will skip some of the slides, because it's really huge. There are 70 slides. So, um, so let's have a um, short look. So what we'll discuss today. So there are actually two parts. So the topic is matching security testing. So what does it mean? So um, I will first um, present the, the big picture. That means setting the pen testing into, into a context in a company. Uh, pen testing as, a, let's say, measuring the security level of a system or a company. Because it, it is a tool, it is a mechanism to, to test the security level of a system. So therefore, we will uh, put it in a big picture, because it's just one of the tools to manage the security effectively. So that's the first part. So I will talk about standards, uh, some processes. Maybe it's not boring. It, it's um, somehow a little bit academic. Um, uh, but we'll see it. Okay. And the second round is, though this is more the small picture. When I say small picture, so I'm actually talking about how do, how do I prepare a pen test? What do I need, I mean, for a successful uh, penetration testing? Yeah? So it means how do I plan? And then what standards do I use when I execute the pen testing? I mean, I know that you all know what uh, SQL injection, cross-scripting um, is. But how do I use this and put it in a, you know, in a context so that there is a value at the end for the company you're working for? Or, um, yeah, good. So this will be everything about this. And then we will also talk about some post-engagement activities. So here we're talking about you know, creating a, um, a valuable uh, report. That means that once you have done your activities, so you will put everything in a report. And we will look um, at this report. So. Uh, what the anatomy of this report is and what should be in this report. So, and one example is, of course, scoring, because it's, it's really uh, challenging to score in the right way so that um, if you say hi, that what does it mean? Yeah? Uh, is, this, is this high for the developer? Is this high for the manager? Is this high for you? Is the same or not? Okay, so therefore, so these are the two parts. So let's move forward regarding plantation testing. Okay. So plantation testing is, is definitely um, essential and more or less, I mean, say, I mean, most of the companies are using that. Uh, either, I mean, they have an internal team or they are engaging third parties. That means that's a big money, <laughs> what you can earn later. Um, because right now you, you hear, uh, I mean, you hear all about the security breaches and at the end, um, the managers are alarmed. So they're also wondering if they also can be hacked. So therefore, they are hiring pen testers to check if they have also security flow in their company. So it means that it's really an essential, let's say, essential measure in a company to see what the security level is. Then furthermore, um, it, it provides you always a snapshot of the current security posture because it's one-time activity. And then in a, in a certain context, 
you know, you, you are testing a certain application level, so a release, a certain system, and the system will, I mean, definitely change the next day. Yeah, so it means it's always a snapshot. So, um, so it, it's, it's valuable, so therefore, you should do that always on a regular basis. So, however, um, the question is here that if pen test itself is sufficient to say, okay, so we are safe or we are not safe. Yeah, even the question maybe, I don't know, it's a taboo thema, <laughs> but uh, you need to ask if it's sufficient or not. So we will, um, uh, so my question, I mean, my, my answer here is definitely is not sufficient, yeah? So therefore, the clear answer is no, uh, because there are some constraints and limitations. And we will look, or we will try to explore, attempt to explore, what does it mean here? Okay, because right now, I mean, if you see the yeah, current security threat landscape, and if you, if, you, if, you, I mean, if you look at the media, so what's happening, what have been hacked and so on, you see that there are lots of challenges right now. So um, this is, the point is that now there are so-called agile uh, development processes. That means um, where the business is changing, there is a time to market, which is really short. So therefore the companies are trying to bring software faster to market, or they are moving into the cloud. So, which means that um, um, there is a, I mean, a fast changing um, a pace. You need to keep on with security testing, and that's not always possible. So, these are right now the challenges um, if you do pen testing, because later on you will see that you don't have, you know, two weeks time to pen test something. Yeah, um, how, how does it fit into the current development process? Or even if you buy a software off the shelf product and you want to integrate that into, the, into your environment, even then maybe you don't have the right time. So we will see, I mean, how we can tackle this. Yeah? So, so therefore, uh, I mean, further questions are, of course, that um, what, what is a, a successful pen test at the end? Yeah? I'm sure you will say, okay, if I find a SQL injection, it's successful, that's right. But the point is at the end, um, I mean, you don't know how many issues, security flows are there. Yeah? Okay, I'm not sure, I mean, if this is too fast or not. Short feedback, okay. So, furthermore, uh, you see also that the attacks are even more sophisticated, yeah? So therefore we'll see how we can also address this topic with different technologies, with different te uh, testing techniques here. So, furthermore, I mean, the miniatures are, at the end, the, the big challenge is always the cost, yeah? Of course, I mean, you can hire 20 um, hackers or pen testers for testing um, and, and let them test forever, but the point is that it's, it's always a cost. Yeah, the cost is driven, of course, uh, by, by the uh, workforce, uh, workforce you're hiring and also when do you do the testing, yeah? So you see a diagram, so the reference is from one from IBM and one from NIST, so NIST, um, let's say, is, is the, like the German BSI, uh, uh, Bundesamt für um, Informationssicherheit. Um, you see that this, so this cost, so um, that means over the application life cycle. That means the cost when you detect a security flow in the software, what does it cost to fix it? So on the left side, you see, uh, you know, when you do the design, on the right side, you see when the product is in the production. So if you find the, secu uh, if you find the security flow, uh, in the production, and the cost to fix it is, I think IBM says, one of the times, and um, uh, NIST says 30 times. So let's take an average of, um, let's say, um, 60, 65, so something around that. Yeah? So it means that there is a huge cost around that. So therefore, we need to shift, uh, shift left. That means that the activity uh, needs to uh, I mean, be done also on the at, at the beginning of software acquisition or software development, yeah? not only in the production. But at the end, I mean, the managers are always looking at the cost. So in order to address this, there are some initiatives. So um, the initiative, when I say initiative, is these are security standards, ISO standard, not sure if you, you know, already familiar, let's say, with the overall standardization of security management systems. So the ISO standards, so there is maybe, you know, you have already heard about the ISO 2701, 
which is the information security management system. Um, such system, these are quality systems. It means these are tools and processes and people and technologies to effectively and efficiently manage your security. Yeah? It just gives you, you know, tools to manage the security. So there, is, so there is a standard for the overall security management in a company, but now there is also a standard for the application security management. So what does it mean here? So I will just skip this. It, it just shows you know, the, how the, uh, the application security management standard, um, how, how, how is it related to the other, other standards. So let's, let's have a look on this picture. Maybe it's clearer. So this ISO standards um, is a guidance um, how to introduce in a company an application security management system. That means at the end that you are developing uh, processes, security checks, or security controls for the complete life cycle. That means when you start with the design, what do you need to do? So what do you need to bring in at the design phase? Yeah? So you have to develop that because we have, uh, we have seen that on the, cost, um, on the cost page that if you start you know, very early with security in the development process, the cost for fixing issues is low. So therefore, such standards help you to bring in or to build up an application security management system um, to address all the issues during the complete life cycle. The standard itself is just a guidance. It's just a guidance. It doesn't provide you know, a checklist. It doesn't say you have to use, uh, for example, certain techniques to prevent SQL injection. It just says, okay, um, do a risk management-based approach. That means do a risk assessment and see what you need for your business. Yeah? Because, so therefore, you see like uh, on the organization uh, wide, uh, or our application, on the left side, the organization normative framework. So it's, it's a container of components like um, application security controls library. That means you need to build up application controls. That means when you build up uh, uh, or when you develop an application that you need to define security controls. What needs to be there when you, when you build or even when you buy an uh, application. So, so this is, let's say, um, the organization normative framework is, is more or less a reference model. And then whenever you develop an application that it's an instance of the application normative framework. So on the lower side, you see the application security lifecycle reference model. That means, so this is the process, this is the reference, pro, uh, reference process to, uh, to say, okay, what needs to be done um, in each step of the application development until the application is disposed. That means that from the idea up to the point where you don't need the application at the end. So it's, I think it's heavy stuff because um, it's, it's really <laughs> academic if you read it. So I had also difficulties, you know, to go through all of the terms. You need to, uh, first of all, read, you know, a glossar of, I don't know, 100 terms. You need to, first of all, learn how does it work together, yeah? Um, and please be aware that if such standards are, you know, built up and published, there are years of, you know, development work and there are experts working on it. And then, of course, then nobody can expect that, you know, uh, that is implemented and everybody understands that. But it's definitely worthwhile to take a look um, at it uh, to learn, okay, wh what is it, I mean, what, what needs to uh, be in place to have a successful application security management system? So, so this is just, let's say, a model to give you let, um, some information maybe to explore by yourself um, and then to find out more what does it mean. So on this slide we see a little bit more, uh, but I think I have already um, covered some of the aspects here, how this standard here works. So let's just move on. So and in this standard, so there are, there are references to already existing industry best practices. And not sure how many of you are Microsoft users. Mac? Uh, okay. <laughs> so the, the others don't use anything, okay? <laughs> so in this standard, so uh, the so-called Microsoft security development lifecycle is referenced. So um, what does it mean? So Microsoft has indeed, uh, believe it or not, indeed invested, you know, lots of money to build up a security 
um, the security development life cycle. Yeah, because I mean the reputation was really bad, insecure, virus, everything, but they have really built up um, and then framework which is compromising um, processes, tools, technologies to, to, to develop and to use secure software. Yeah? So if, I mean, if you visit the page there, you will see that they provide lots of documentation, lots of also tools. So you may also try out, for example, the surface analyzer. So it's, it's, it's a tool, you can instantly use it. They have also, so I will show you later, a so-called threat modeling tool, all for free. You can use it, they are really good. So um, it's already in the, f in, in the third generation. So there are lots of tools, lots of documentation. Um, so there is definitely a good starting point. So beside the Microsoft Security Development Lifecycle, which is referenced by the ISO standard, of course, there are also some, uh, let's say, not open source, but yeah, free available um, standards, organizations, um, like OWASP. Not sure if you get across OWASP. So, so maybe you're already familiar if you already do some hacking, some pen testing, so the open, open web application security project. So it's also huge, it's lots of information. You can also get lots of um, uh, tools there for, for hacking or for pen testing. So there is also OWASP testing framework. So there's also a collection of techniques, um, uh, information, um, then a mechanism for introducing or for, for doing a successful testing. And you can also see that they also start you know, um, setting up policies in a company. That means this is, this is the baseline where you're starting because everything what you do, uh, even for pen testing, it should be definitely part of a security concept, yeah? Um, you may think, okay, that, I mean, if I do a pen test, of course there is some value, but it has a greater value if you, if you, if you put it in a, in a context. That means that if it's a part of a security management or a security concept. So therefore, you see that there are several steps from the uh, establishing a policy, embedding in an in a, in a environment, uh, then going through the uh, definition and design phase. That means that when you uh, design an application, when you develop an application, so what are the requirements so that you know what you're expecting because the application is intended for a certain business purpose, for a certain business um, process. So you will see the several steps here. Um, that from, from requirements review, code review, penetration testing, and um, um, of course then the verification during the operation. So we will have a, a closer look in the, in the further slide, what does it mean, what the activities are. So, um, so if it's not sufficient, you know, regarding the OWASP testing framework, so they have lo lots of standards, um, processes, software maturity models, and OWASP SAM is, is one of these um, uh, software um, secu uh, security assurance maturity model. What does it mean? So we have, I mean, we have seen there is a standard, which is a process model, and uh, the, the assurance maturity model, uh, this is a, um, um, a collection of tools or mechanism to measure the, um, how good your process is, how good it's working, how it's implemented. So again, you see that from left to the right, so we see you know, policy and compliance, then during the construction phase, construction means design and development of applications, that what activities, what security practices needs to be done. So that means that you can use this to measure how successful you are with your application security management. Yeah? So you can even check, I mean, do I do, let's say, do I have a policy for, uh, for application security management? Do I have a policy for coding or a standard for coding? Um, then on the other hand, um, do I do a threat assessment? That means when you have a you know, design paper ready, do you review that? Is there a quality review? So it means all this is measured and then you can, you know, then at the end you will have a result where you are with your processes. Yeah? And the objective is always you know, to get better over time. It doesn't mean that you have to implement and then you will be really you know, on top. So it's more or less an um, evolving process. That means um, you need to apply that, you need to see, okay, what can be done better the next time. So you see then during the life cycle, there are certain security practices um, uh, you may apply on your application or on your environment. We, we talked about the security architecture, threat assessment, then design review, security testing, code review, and so on. Okay, so 
On this slide, we'll see, let's say, a uh, real-life example, how this is implemented in a company. So on top, we see the different phases in the security development lifecycle. And then we see the activities, yeah? What document needs to be created and, uh, or what documents are input for the security work um, we are performing or you are going to perform. So uh, starting in the concept phase, yeah? So it is indeed um, the point that um, in, in most companies that you are not always testing in the production environment. It really starts earlier. So when a project is set up and then there is already an idea uh, for, a, for a secret development or uh, acquisition that you start with the security. So, and this is a real, real life example. And uh, you see the so-called quality gate. That means if you have a process for development from the design, um, coding, uh, then testing, deployment, operation, you see that these quality gates. And these quality gates are more or less milestones uh, in the life cycle to measure you know, um, how far we are with all the activities. That means it's, it, it's a gate, and at this gate, you are checking, OK, can we move further or not? Do we have still the quality? So, and this is, let's say, a practical example. That means at the gate, there are gate meetings then in the companies. And then there are criteria. The criteria means, OK, um, have been, this, is the security, be, uh, security review being conducted or not? Yeah? So it means if it's not co uh, conducted and it's mandatory, we see that um, there is a criteria for if it's mandatory or not mandatory. It's mandatory. That means they cannot move further. Yeah? So therefore, in most cases, by the way, if you have security in the lifecycle process, sometimes for the project, you are the risk. Because they know if you don't do your work and it's mandatory, then they see you as a risk because they cannot move further. Yeah? So this is a real, a real life example so that you see that um, you know, this is a, there is a so-called gatekeeper. So this is the person who checks independently from all the stakeholders um, how far we are in the life cycle. OK, so let's move ahead, let's say a little bit, um, and see what the details are, the security in the um, software development life cycle. Yeah? So you see again that the, the several steps in security development. We see rec uh, requirements, uh, requirements analysis, design. That means that I mean, you have always so-called business requirements, functional requirements for a software. Um, and so-called non-functional requirements. Non-functional requirements uh, means these are constraints on the functional requirements. So that starts with the requirements and design phase. Then you are going to code that or let it code. Uh, or, and then you have testing. There are different types of testing, like um, uh, unit testing, system testing, integration testing, operation readiness testing. So there are, I don't know, I, I think, so from a guts feeling, 20 different types of testing, by the way. Yeah. And then there is deployment. Deployment means that once this, everything is ready, um, the, the software is tested, you are going to bring in the application into your operational environment. Again, there is a you know, deployment process, how to bring it in. There's a change management process. So there is much more. And then once this is deployed, you are going to use the software. Yeah, it could be a, you know, a simple web application or a native application. It doesn't matter at the end. So now if you look at that, so what do we do at these at the, at this different steps here? So at, um, at the beginning, requirement and design. So um, we, we have to em embed the security exactly you know, here from, from the starting here. So what you do is that in most cases, the designers are presenting a design how the application should work, what the data flows are, uh, what components are there, what interfaces are, what kind of data, who's going to use that. So they are create you know, very fancy diagrams like use cases, scenarios. So all this will happen in this phase. And this is a good, valuable, uh, and very important information for you. So if, if you're not, even not, uh, you know, um, maybe uh, it's not a pen test, but this is a, a review of the application, so it's very valuable. If you understand the application, um, you are most likely going to also find the flows later uh, in the, uh, when, when the system is deployed. So during this stage, that means that you are analyzing the requirements, um, the security requirements, if they are built in into the application, uh, plus you are doing the security threat modeling. So we will have a closer look on the next slide. So 
This is the, the starting point here. So, and that's something you cannot automate, yeah, because it's always manual work, because you need to you know, um, understand how it works and bring it together, analyze that, and so, so far there is no you know, um, robot who is doing that for you. So it's, let's say it's desired. So this is a desired activity, very important activity, but it's not common. Yeah? So the bigger companies are doing that more and more, uh, but it, it will definitely, you know, you will see uh, lots of applications that uh, security will be built in before, you know, uh, close to the go live. Yeah? So, and if you do requirements management at the end, so, and we talked about that you need to build up a policy and, you know, security management system, then uh, one um, aspect is that you need to also manage your requirements. That means you need to uh, build up security requirements for, for the applications or for security coding. So um, you see here an extract from a security requirements ba a baseline. That means so these are security requirements which is always passed to the project and then uh, and you are asking, okay, do you comply? You have to consider that during the coding and deployment phase. Yeah, so that's definitely one of the tasks of the you know, security analyst or security manager to, to, to demand that, by the way. Yeah, so in most cases, this is mandatory. So we also talk about the threat modeling. What does it mean? I don't know if the term threat modeling is already known or if somebody is already doing something. So the threat modeling, so this is um, a screenshot from the Microsoft threat modeling tool, which I think is a <laughs> very, uh, very useful tool. Um, threat modeling means, maybe I take this slide, it's better. Not sure if you can see that. So uh, when, you, when you develop an application, so how does it work? You create so-called use cases. Use case means that you have a certain scenario and then you are using this software, let's say this application, and there are certain steps um, how you use this application. And these use cases are a sequence of activities um, yeah, done by actor, so-called actors, and how the application will be consumed. Yeah? It's more or less a theoretical you know, uh, scenario, let's say an action flow, how the software is used. It could be very simple like that you are logging into the system. You see here the steps from you, you entering the username and the password, then user authentication, then um, uh, you see that if, you know, if, if the username or password is uh, not valid, then you will get an error message. And then you see the different steps here. So these are use cases, and uh, these are usually described if you develop a software. So, and here, so our work begins here, that we take these use cases and, and think about the design if there are misuse cases. Yeah, so um, what happens if, if the user is entering something different than expected? So how does the uh, application react to this? Yeah, can you provoke that, you know, it, it shows more error, or let's say valuable uh, or important information when it generates an error message? Yeah, so what if you, uh, you know, um, if you enter more uh, characters than expected? How does it behave? Or let's say, or if you enter a character um, which is not alphanumeric, yeah? So, and this is something you do later also in, I mean, when you do the pen testing, yeah? Because you're playing around with the parameters if you, if you want to hack something, then you are playing around with the parameters, but I mean, the actual work starts here that you, you already, you know, need to, really to um, think about that uh, what, what can go wrong? Because if you do that later, it costs lots of money to fix that. But if you, if you detect, let's say, such flaws already in the design phase, um, it's easy to fix because it's not developed so far. Yeah? So the sequence is always clear. I mean, it is um, very clear. We have so, the so-called scenarios for use cases. Then you derive from the use cases as security expert, the misuse case. Um, and then from the misuse case, the outcomes, of course, a security requirement, which we have seen here. Yeah. So it means that if you see, you know, uh, okay, if you identify a, a, a misuse case and then you drive a security requirement, and this is valid for more or less 
almost all application, and then it's uh, application agnostic, then it's something you need to update your security requirements. Questions so far? Uh, how does a developer react when you show him, in the meantime of some years of experience, uh, 100 pages of security? And you try to uh, we have lots of discussion. They, they don't like us. Yeah. <laughs> I know that from the QA part. But, uh, yeah. Um, indeed, so, so um, that's a good question. Uh, thank you for the question. The point is that, of course, I mean, if you, if, if you, if you, you know, talk to them and say, okay, here are requirements, uh, sometimes, I mean, even it's 100 pages, yeah, with lots of requirements. Of course, I, I mean, then it's always a problem for them because they have certain timelines to develop, to code, and to deliver, yeah? So they are... Um, they have to deliver that. And if you come with one of that requirements, it means that there is additional work for them, or they see it as an additional work. And then they see you as a risk, yeah? because they don't meet their project timelines. So therefore, it's really important that we have a security concept or security management in place, let's say, to educate them, to, to train them why it is important, yeah? to show what the value is starting at this point. Yeah? Not only the developer, I think the, sp uh, the, the sponsors of the projects, the, the, the business, yeah? because they are paying at the end. Um, everything, I mean, at the end, it's everything about money. <laughs> yeah? So um, in some of the developers or project managers, they are okay. They, are, I mean, okay they, are, they have some security awareness. Some of them are not. They are, they are under some pressure, and you have to argue. And if you don't have the empowerment in a company, you have a problem. <laughs> Does it yeah. answer your question? Okay. So, and if you look at that, so in sometimes in an application, you have lots of use cases. Yeah? And doing that manually could be very long. So therefore, there are tools like from Microsoft, that you, you take the design and then you're trying to deco decompose the application to see, okay, if there are you know, errors in the design or security flaws in the design. So that means that it's a tool-based approach to identify risk in the design. Yeah? Um, the, the tool is, by the way, free and there are also open source Tools like Trike, I like always these funny pictures, <laughs> or Sea Monster, <laughs> or SpongeBob, uh, Sea Sponge. So this is also from a university in Canada. So this is a browser based, so you can, I mean, download it and try it. So it's really worthwhile to have a look at it, Sea Sponge. Um, so th there are much more, but um, I know this one. So, um, I mean, just go ahead and, and, and try them out. Yeah, some of them browser-based, some of them native uh, Windows applications, and um, some of them needs a little bit training because you need to, I mean, of course, you need to familiarize uh, with the terms and how to use that and how to model that, but uh, very useful, yeah? Okay, let's move ahead with the pen testing. So we have seen, I mean, at the beginning, the, the design review, threat modeling, and then, so we are, I mean, going back to the, okay, to the end of the process. Uh, so I will come back to the coding and testing phase. So usually the, the pen testing is done during the production, yeah? And if you, uh, during the production, we have said that already that it costs lots of money to fix that, yeah? Most companies do it in the production, it's okay, do it on a regular basis, but this shouldn't be, you know, the only measure you are doing, yeah? And if you do it at the end, there is a, you know, a big or a long risk window from introducing application and then testing that someone in the production. It could be months or even years sometimes. Um, some companies test also during the deployment phase. What does it mean? Once the application is ready, you are close you know, to, the, to the production to go to live. And then before it goes live, you have in general some weeks you know, for let's say operation readiness testing where the so-called pre-production environment is ready and it's like production environment. And this is, let's say, the time you can do your pen test also. 
But you need to also consider that when you identify some issues, yeah, they still need some time to fix it. Yeah? Again, the experience is that they often come really close some days before go live and can do the testing. So, okay, we can do the testing. We need, let's say, 10 days. But then after 10 days, they have no time to fix it. That means that at the end, in the worst case, we identify, an, let's say, a big issue, and they can't go live. Yeah? So everything I mean, comes to the point that do a risk management. Yeah? And by the way, I mean, everybody is doing risk management and doing re really very well. So for example, if you cross a road, some of you, you know, do risk management because there are cars coming, cars crossing, and then sometimes you pass, you know, the, this, the road or, or not, and sometimes, you know, some, some take more risk between the cars. And by the way, there's also something, I think, um, uh, very important to understand that risk is not always a risk because, um, the risk appetite, that means the risk you're accepting is always different. Yeah? Also for companies, that means that if, if some company says, I don't care about medium risk, I will go ahead. If, they're, if, if it's their policy, it's okay, because their risk appetite is much higher. Because if you have a risk, then there's always a chance, because that means a financial gain at the end. So this is also something you need to consider when you do pen testing, what your risk appetite in a company is. That means what, what kind of risk level they are accepting at the end. So like if you cross the road and we you know, do it in a different way, yeah? Okay, so the pen testing will take place usually in this phase, but in most cases, you know, this is not sufficient, yeah? Because we are close to the um, go live and fixing is an issue. So therefore, um, we need to you know, again, shift left, that means we need to start on the left side and then do something before. So, um, by the way, this type of testing doesn't, doesn't work or is not compatible with so-called the agile development um, process. Um, as explained, I mean, in the introduction, so it means that we have a, f a fast pace here, that means um, um, developing, deploying. So, so far, there is a called waterfall development life uh, um, um, process. That means, you know, you are developing something and then it, it goes through different steps before it is deployed and then, you, you, I mean, you have the next round. But in the agile development process, what you do is you sometimes deploy even several times at a day. Then you have no time to test. Or you have, you know, a certain time frame yeah? So that means you need to adapt your security testing, how we do the pen testing, do we have enough time or not. So, therefore, we said we need to shift left and we need to automate some processes. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So, beside security pen testing and design review, we need to do a little bit more. So, the next um, activity would be do some automated so-called static analysis. That means you are taking the code, and you're using tools to find security flows in the code itself. It's usually automated, and um, that means that there are some um, SAST, so-called SAST systems already deployed in your network, which, uh, who, which automatically check the uh, software code here to detect security flows in the, um, in the software. Um, and this is complementary to, to manual testing because you cannot detect everything with manual pen testing. On the other hand, um, you cannot detect everything with static analysis. Yeah? So one of the famous examples is the so-called hard bleed. You t who talked about SSL? Did you talk about SSL? Ma yeah? Next week. Next week, okay, next week. So you will have you will discuss the SSL or TLS stuff. And the so-called hard bleed, um, vulnerability, so this was one of the famous and yeah, most severe vulnerabilities uh, detected in 2014. It was more or less, I mean, that every web application which was, let's say, secured uh, with SSL could be exploited. That means that you could get passwords or some more business information from the web server. Yeah, and it was really, it was really a task. And there was, at the end, a tool which, which you can deploy and then get all this data there. And um, the heartbleed was detected 
especially using static code analyzer. Yeah? And by the way, and this vulnerability was in the software for years because the library which was used, the open SSL library, was there for years. Yeah? And some say that it was already known to NSA. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah? So this is a good example that you need different activities during the life cycle, not only man manual penetration testing, um, but also static code analysis. Uh, most of the companies, let's say they are starting to use that, is not common, but the bigger companies are using that in certain areas. Questions so far? Still ready to go? I have much more slides. <laughs> okay. I will a little faster. Okay, so <laughs> there is much more. I mean, besides the static, we have dynamic. That means that these are automated security vulnerability, um, um, automated vulnerability assessment. That means there are already um, applications deployed in your environment, which you know, which are doing the application assessment automatically. Um, I'm talking about here vulnerability assessment. There, are, there are also tools uh, of the shelf products which are doing the penetration testing automatically. Of course, it has some drawbacks yeah, because you can't achieve the quality of manual pen test. So that means you see that we have different activities at the different phases. Doesn't mean, I mean, that you have to apply everything. You need to build up your own concept in a company. So, okay, now, Let's bring together, let's say, the terminology. We, we talked about the application security testing and the open um, SAM um, standard here, that uh, how this is mapped, yeah? Like SAST for the code review, that means static analysis for code review, uh, the term DUST for dynamic analysis uh, um, during the security testing and the runtime. This is just an attempt, you know, to bring together, let's say, the, the commercial and the OWASP SAM together. So, okay. We are already through the first part, by the way. Okay, I need to hurry up. So, um, now, what is the takeaway from the, from the first part of the presentation? Yeah? We see that, I mean, Pentest is really an effective and, and an essential mechanism to detect issues and to help um, to improve the security. But it is definitely something which is complementary to our security activities like we have seen some minutes before. Um, and at the end, of course, I mean, a good expert like you, it will be later or now, can't be replaced, let's say, by some automatic tools at the end, yeah? And it must be definitely also part of a security concept, yeah? So these are my main messages here. So, so let's, let's go for the second round here if you're not K.O. <laughs> um, okay, now we have, you know, talked about, let's say, the big picture about an application security management and the different aspects during the life cycle. So, um, on the last slides, I will talk about, you know, in about the, let's say, small picture. What do you need before you do pen tests? What is required? Um, there are some aspects you need to consider, and also um, what if you have, you know, finished your pen testing, your hacking, um, how, how does the report look like? So, first of all, um, for the pen testing, please build up your own, let's say, not, not your standard, but first of all, look at which standards are there, a pen test frameworks. There are lots of or different. Um, pen test fra security frameworks, um, which you can choose here. Um, um, familiarize with yourself, select the one which fits you, yeah? Because at the end, you need to take a standardized approach. We know that pen testing is somehow creative, you know, you do some analysis, and it's always uh, fun to, to, to hack something, but at the end, it should be a systematic approach. Yeah? Because at the end, if you, if, you, if you have an application in front of you, um, you don't know how many security flows are there. How do you measure that, that you are successful at the end? Yeah? So therefore, you need to combine, let's say, the creative elements um, and the, the, the structural standards way to test something. 
Yeah? You need to combine to get the most of your activities here. So um, I, I will not go through all of these standards. So um, I think the slides will be distributed anyway. So you can go and visit, visit this. And at the end, you need to select one standard for you. Yeah? And then um, there are lots of guidance there, how to prepare, how to do, wh what kind of checks you need to do. And of course, the core of the activities like SQL injection, cross-scripting, uh, cr uh, cross or anything else, then, then this is something, uh, this is your repository later. And then and, um, you need to adapt it also for yourself. Yeah? So I have listed the you know, technical testing frameworks, but also um, two um, uh, project management standards here. So um, is, is the PMI, uh, Project Management uh, Institute, um, um, Book of Knowledge, and PRINCE2. So there are two project management standards. Uh, you, you shouldn't be an expert in project management, but at least you should find yourself, how do I manage this? How do I organize this? Yeah. So, so therefore, have a, I mean, closer look. It could be a little bit boring, the project management stuff. But um, uh, nonetheless, take a look and take you know, something, what, what is really helping you at the end to perform a pen test, successful pen testing. Because you, you, need to do a, um, you need to have a good plan. Because it's not only I mean, that you start pen testing, you do some hacking, but uh, a good planning is definitely one of the success factors yeah, for a good pen test. So therefore, um, the quality matrix for um, pen testing is definitely, it must be reasonable. That means that it should make sense what you do at the end. And also the statements, it must be measurable at the end and comparable. Um, sometimes the pen testers, you know, they hide, how, um, uh, they hide what methods they have applied. Yeah. So um, my experience is that when I do some audits on cloud providers or third parties, and then they, they sometimes provide also pen test reports about the application. And then we go through it, and then I see, okay, they have done a pen test. Um, the document looks very good, you know, really uh, lots of colors, some diagrams. But then I see, okay, three issues. At the end, I don't have a good feeling because I don't, I don't know what they have tested, when they have tested, which application they have, I mean, which version they have tested. And I don't know if they have done some, I mean, what kind of our um, test cases they have applied. Because I don't have the full picture. I don't know, okay, are these the three issues they have found or is, is there more? Yeah. So it's really difficult to judge at the end um, if, this if this was a very successful test or not. Yeah. At the end, I mean, you have a feeling, okay, I don't trust. And sometimes um, we have done our own testing. That means usually if you, if you buy a cloud service um, on enterprise level, then you ask for so-called third-party pen test. That means that the service providers are hiring pen testers to test it. And then um, in order you know, to save money, you look at the, I mean, you ask for the pen test report, and then you go through it, a walk through. Um, this could be... Um, you know, they can send you this as in a paper format or in an electronic format or in a web session. So um, then we do this walkthrough to see, okay, is this reasonable what they have done? Um, what kind of tests they have done? Yeah? Uh, who have done this? So, um, and I see that um, some of the pen tests are, okay, we don't have trust. And sometimes then we are doing the pen testing for benchmarking. And then you come then to a different results than what they have done. Yeah? Um, so therefore, um, all the ideas, what I'm explaining or what I'm showing here is really something we experience in the field. And um, I will also uh, you know, show some report, which is more or less what we are using, but also a wish for the future. <laughs> so so if, if you look at the testing quality metrics like reasonably measurable, it must be a risk-based approach. That means um, even if you do pen test, so I will do a walkthrough of the application. That means um, I will first of all see what's the application for, uh, uh, for which business process to understand it first from a functional perspective before I do a pen test. Because the more you understand from the application, yeah, then, then you, you, you can get a, um, um, out of, uh, most out of the pen testing later. So also one topic is the scoring at the end. So if you find something, then um, how do you measure, how do you do the scoring? 
uh, yeah. Uh, for example, we have all this discussion, is um, cross-site scripting more dangerous than SQL injection, for example, yeah, or, or the same level, yeah. So s some of the pen tests, when we read the um, pen test, um, some are um, scoring cross-scripting with medium, some scoring as high. What does it mean at the end? Yeah, do they use the same, you know, um, calculations in the background or not? So this, this is a big challenge at the end, and will be a challenge always, by the way. Yeah, good. So if you do a pen test and then, you know, to talk to the company, you would like to test. So um, there are some, um, some topics to consider here. Um, first of all, you should be always very clear about the goals. So I, I have a um, separate slide for that. Then, um, by the way, these are some crucial points. There, are, there, there, there is a bit more of this. So uh, in the standards I listed before in, uh, in one of the slides, uh, there are good guidelines, some more details. So these are the you know, most important points. So I put, I put it on this slide. So the first thing is define the goals with your customer. Yeah? Uh, whoever you are going to test, talk to them, ask for an expectation. Um, and furthermore, if you do also some you know, social engineering hacks, yeah? um, sometimes you do a phishing email you know, to get to the system, it's a little bit more pen testing, it's more hacking. Um, so this is a certain topic, I will come back to this later on a the slide. Um, then establish lines of communication, what does it mean? That at the end, if you do testing, you need to inform maybe the so-called security operations center. What does it mean? Usually they have monitoring in the network, yeah? And in large companies, if you do some pen testing and they are not informed, then they, they may react to this and you pen test will maybe fail, yeah? Or they will alarm senior management. <laughs> so uh, there are lots of surprises, I mean, we experience, by the way. So this is not only something theoretical, that this happened, yeah? Then if you do pen testing, please, I mean, be aware that um, something may happen to the application, the application may go down and the application is very important or very business critical, then uh, there should be an emergency um, process and emergency contact. So who do you contact when something happens? Yeah. Um, also, how, how the incidents are reported is important. Yeah. What kind of incidents reported? You're not going to you know, report um, any of your findings during the testing, uh, but the most critical one. So this needs to be um, clarified at the beginning of a testing. Then um, you need to agree on the status reporting frequency, uh, how often the customer would like to be informed. So you see that also there are um, some other topics like secure communication. So if you do a pen test and then the pen test report, you have to share that or some information. Um, be careful not to share it without any encryption because you may you know, disclose information to, to unauthorized people who, may, uh, I mean, who, um, who can misuse them at the end. Yeah? Be clear about timelines, also locations, yeah? Um, we had also some funny, you know, experience regarding where do we do the testing, yeah? It's not always on-site on the customer side. It, it may be later uh, from your company side or you are going to test it uh, from the home office. It means when you work at home and then you do the testing from there, uh, be very careful because there are also precautions to take, yeah? Where do you test? So, um, the first point was the security testing pen test goals. Be always clear, ask the customer for the expectation, yeah? What is their intent at the end? Is it something they want to have, uh, I mean, have more or less a signature at the end, we, we have been tested, uh, or because uh, the, the senior management asked uh, the, the business unit, uh, or uh, because a, a supplier, you know, um, is asking for a pen test because their customers is asking. So be very clear about this, or is it just for compliance? Um, um, we had, uh, we were also, by the way, benchmark. Benchmark means that um, we have performed, we were hired to, uh, to do a pen testing, um, an application. Uh, at the same time, they have hired also different companies, and they are comparing uh, the both companies regarding the uh, performance and success, yeah? Um, this is also something you need to consider. So um, during the testing, what the goal of the testing is, what the customer is expecting, yeah? 
Um, because if the customer gets an offer, we do the testing in three days. The other company says we do the testing in 10 days. Um, be very clear what their intention is. Yeah? Otherwise, you will be kicked out because you say we need 10 days. Um, so therefore, it's, it's very important that you are very clear and a clear communication with the customer about the uh, goal of the pen test. Yeah? So there are, of course, some more topics uh, in, which needs to be discussed with the customer. So um, you see the, that if they have a, um, a security lifecycle development in place, if there's a security management system in place. So this is something you need to be aware of because when we come later to the uh, scoring, uh, it's important to understand if they have already a scoring system established, which you can use, by the way. So um, I said that uh, the social engineering testing is, is a little bit ambiguous because uh, if you do social hacks, uh, you always prove that, that everybody can do a mistake. Yeah? If you open a phishing email or something, that you will always see that it will always work somehow. And you will always prove that we are, you know, <laughs> we are human and we will, we will do uh, you know, some mistakes or errors. So therefore, be very careful if you do social engineering hacks and if this is part of your pen testing. Yeah? Be very careful. And um, there is a project ongoing uh, driven by Unibon. There are some yeah, good, I would say, uh, very, um, very good papers about that. So if you're interested, just visit. Um, and have a look at that. So the project is called Ida Security Awareness Penetration Testing. It's called the human hacking. Okay. Then further topics to consider is legislation in the country you are, yeah? Because um, there are already some legislations um, and you need to consider here, you need to be aware of if you do pen testing. Otherwise, um, you could be later you know, in a jail, and um, this, I mean, this already happened, yeah? Um, so uh, I talked to some colleagues uh, yeah, in, in the area where they have been uh, visited by the police, yeah? And the topic is that if you do something, yeah? So uh, the paragraphs means that if you do an unauthorized scan or penetration testing on, not on your own system, uh, then it's definitely a criminal act. So therefore, it's always important that whenever you do a pen testing, that there is a security testing agreement in place. This is like if you go to the doctor and you are going to be operated, they also ask, okay, I informed you about the risk and um, I'm, I'm going to injure you because it's, it's injuring you. And they're asking for the permissions, you know, to cut you at the end, yeah? So it's a similar approach here. So uh, you're asking for permissions you know, to hack or to pen test or to bring down the system at the end in the worst case. And this is something you, know, you need to have it in place. Yeah? So um, this is very often you know, overseen. Yeah? It's sometimes verbal. But believe me, if something goes wrong in a company and you bring down the system yeah, and the people are in panic, in stress, they forget what you have talked to them. <laughs> And they didn't authorize you, you know, to do the pen testing, or maybe they, they did, you know, authorize you the pen testing, but maybe not to bring this down the system. That means you get in trouble if you don't have an agreement and be very clear about what you are going to do and what the risks are when you do the pen testing. So what you see here is, this is not a, uh, this is, by the way, an, an anatomy of the security agreement. Um, so we have established and, and we use it um, as an agreement between the customer and the pen tester. So it clearly says, okay, what you're going to do, what kind of technologies you are going to use, what the target system is, and at the end, blah, 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 that they have to, they have, to do have a backup. If something goes wrong, then you cannot guarantee that uh, something goes, uh, cannot go wrong. So these are all topics. And one topic is the liability. Um, in German, it's Haftung, yeah, um, because... Sometimes um, you do also testing on the cloud. So uh, let's move ahead. And if you do testing in the cloud, that means that let's, let's think about it as a huge system with lots of customers and they are using the same system. Um, and you cannot just go there and test that. You maybe, I mean, you maybe bring down 
uh, more than one customer or the customer you have because there are some other clients on the, on the cloud system. Um, so I have two examples here. Uh, one on the left side, this is, this is from Amazon. So it means whenever you do some testing on Amazon, you have to go there and ask for permission. So on the left side, it's a simula sim simulated event testing and you have to request this testing. Um, on the right side, this is from Microsoft Azure. It's also Microsoft Cloud. And in both cases, you have to, or you definitely need to have, um, have this authorization in place. Um, because at the end, what could go wrong if you do some testing, for example, in the cloud, you can bring down some of our customers, yeah, which were completely out of scope. And by the way, you see on the lower side, so um, um, this here, yeah, at this time, our policy does not permit testing small or micro RDS. Yeah. So this is a relational database system, instance types on the Amazon web service. Yeah, you're not allowed. I mean, even if the customer is using that, yeah, because it's somehow shared between different customers. Yeah, this is something I mean, you need to consider when you do your test planning. Yeah, so this, this is, I mean, not something that you will detect while you do some, you know, actual testing. So, uh, this needs to be clarified before the testing. Questions so far to cloud testing or something like that? Now we have 40 minutes left. <laughs> okay, um, I will move quickly. So the next topic is effort estimation. So, I mean, so we have run through certain topics, need to clarify. And now how do you do the effort estimation? Any idea? How long do you need for, I don't know, for testing a, I mean, you have a, um, let's say, an university information system. So you, you visit that every day. How long would you need to test this? Do you have an idea? One day, two days, 20 days? Any idea? Including the, including the report to the management or just testing? You, you get a beer from me. Good answer. <laughs> good, good question. Uh, yeah. So um, scoping is one of the topics. Yeah. What is a scope? Yeah. Because uh, you see the web page, but there could be much more. Yeah. So it's really difficult to estimate. Let's say how long do you need? But this is something you know. A commercial stuff. If you later do the pen testing, you have to talk about to the customer because the customer is expecting. Okay. Um, now, I have an application here. Can you please test that? And they will ask you, okay, yeah, send me an offer. The point would be if you say three days and at the end you need 20 days, it's your damage, your financial damage. So be very clear how you do the effort estimation. So at the end, there is no easy way, by the way, <laughs> uh, because if you do certain you know, testing and, and, and you have different types of tests you have to apply here. Um, and at the end, it comes down that lots of experience. But nonetheless, there is, let's say, a structured way at least to roughly estimate. So, and these steps, uh, these, these steps are, first of all, list first of all all your activities, starting from preparation, vulnerability scan, you know, uh, detection um, of some um, you know, um, flows or something like that, or open ports. So start from the point and list down all your activities first of all, and then estimate for estimate the, the effort for each task, and then you can drill down for each task how long do you need. So, and um, for the actual testing itself, um, if, if if you look at the at the application, first of all, familiarize with yourself. Um, the type and the purpose of the application. So, for example, we have the university, um, the, the, the information system. So, if you look at that, so you know what's for, yeah? Then you can expect certain functions on this uh, application, yeah? Then be aware what application framework is used. That means the technology, um, you know, to build up this application. Um, so, this is also important. You need to be consider then how many static pages, or how many dynamic pages or business logic complexity, what does it mean? Um, if there's just a static page, 
then there is no forms you can put in, then you can say definitely some test cases will be, uh, won't be executed. But if there's a dynamic page, it means that lots of forms, lots of input fields with different parameters, and these parameters could be you know, um, complex or less complex or just read only or we read write depending on the user roles. So you need to structure this um, and then write down and then also consider the test cases you have to go, uh, you, you have to apply here. So we will, we will have a look on the test cases you may execute yeah, um, on this. So, um, but there is also a, uh, maybe a different approach that you, we talked about the use case at the beginning. So if the use case definition is available to you, then you can also have a look at the use cases because the use cases exactly describes who's the actor and how they interact with the uh, application. Then you know, you know how many, let's say, interactions also you have during your testing, by the way. Yeah? And some of the interactions which can be automated, and some of them are manual. This would be, let's say, good indicators for, for effort estimation. But at the end, uh, you need to have also a pragmatic approach here, yeah? uh, because um, most of the testing is between three and 30 days yeah, in, in average for the applications. And, and you wouldn't do you know, a diploma thesis for a three-day um, application testing. So therefore, you need to just, it's just a gut feeling at the end. So that means that at the end, I mean, there is no easy way to always to estimate. It's experience, experience, experience. But consider all the steps I showed two slides before, yeah? And also a good way, you know, to estimate the effort is have a demo, yeah? Um, so just play around with the application, understand first the application, and see how many different roles, are, user roles are there, and um, how the system is managed, how many different user types are there, and then so, so that you get a feeling for the application, yeah? Um, before do, doing any testing, yeah? Once, I mean, you have learned the application, then it's much more easier, you know, to, uh, to, to um, estimate the, the effort. The, the demo is like, you know, going through the use cases at the end. It's a practical use case workflow. Okay, and we also talk about the different, you know, test cases because if, if you see, I mean, there are lots of dynamic pages with forms and so on. And then you need to know, okay, also, um, what kind of checks you are going to do on these pages, yeah? And again here, a structured approach is very useful. And the structured approach means here taking some checklists which is already there, like from OWASP. So there are already checklists um, going through um, description of the test cases uh, you may apply on certain applications. So for example, if you see there is an application with XML, yeah, then you may, I mean, uh, well, you have to apply all the XML, um, XML test cases. Um, there are also, for example, LDAP, um, LDAP test cases. And uh, if there is no LDAP you know, uh, used on the application, then you may omit this. Yeah? Then, you, then you get a feeling for how long it will take to the testing. So, and all this put together in a so-called test plan now it's a little bit sophisticated. It doesn't need to be you know, that complicated, but at least write down everything you need for the testing. That means that what you're going to test, the scope, um, then the approach, yeah? So this is usually used in, in let's say, enterprise, uh, in bigger companies, it's, it's a formalized approach, but even if you do uh, you know, um, five days pen testing, write down all the information you need at the end, yeah? If you, if you do the testing, because you need to be really prepared, you need to have the information uh, ready to use, yeah? So I will skip this. So we talked about test scope and test cases. So I think I have the link also on the slides. So there is already some checklist test use cases, uh, which is um, yeah, ready to use from OWASP. At the end, if you, if you take this you know, best practice checklist, um, and if you have some experience with that, most likely you are going to create your own test cases at the end, yeah? Use this as a starting point and adapt this for you, yeah? Because at the end you need to understand and then uh, this also a factor, you know, to differentiate between pen testers, yeah? Uh, adding some value on it. 
So, so there are lots of you know test description from OWASP. If you go to the OWASP page, then you will I mean just look for that and you will see uh, the different checklist or descriptions here. So now coming to the reporting. Um, so at the end, I mean once you have done all this planning execution using some standards and you have um, you have done it, and usually you need to already take notes during the testing because. If you, do, if you do the reporting at the end and you have taken no notes, believe me, you will forget 30%. <laughs> so that means take notes during the testing or create a template. So you see on the left side, um, sorry, no, um, this is just best practices, there is anatomy. Where is this? We'll come back with later, okay. Um, so for the best practices, for reporting, so take down notes while you are testing, yeah? So it means every, every finding or take notes because then it's much easier later to, to finalize the reporting. And you may even create a skeleton for the reporting and then you may directly type it into your report, yeah? Which accelerates everything, yeah? Um, at the beginning, I mean, what we have done is that we have written the reports at the end after 10 days, yeah? And then it took very long, you know, to create. And then it was discussion um, or go through, let's say, all the metadata we created during the testing, um, how the parameter was. Uh, so therefore, we, are, we, have a, we have a report template skeleton. That means that while we are testing and there is some time, we are then taking notes into report. Yeah. So um, again, I mean, the same topics, the best practices. Um, regarding um, descriptions, unit tracking number, and so on, scoring title. So I will just uh, skip this. Uh, you can read this later. Uh, then standardize your reports. It's very important. Uh, you don't want to write, I mean, every report uh, from, the, from the start, from the beginning, create really a skeleton here. Then also, you got a beer, right? <laughs> um, so that be aware who's going to read your report at the end. Yeah. So is manager, developer, project manager, engineer, at the end, it's all of them, by the way. Because the manager wants to see, okay, what is the business impact at the end? Yeah. We are talking about technical impact, uh, and for us, it's in most cases very high. Uh, but at the end, the, the managers are thinking a different way. Okay, maybe there are some technical flows, but does it also mean a business impact? Yeah. Sometimes it's, it's not. Yeah. Maybe the application, I don't know, there is not revenue generating. So therefore, um, be very clear that you have at the beginning an executive summary, more or less, and high-level summary. Um, what was the you know, goal? Uh, what have been done? What was the approach? And the summary of findings. And what, what the conclusion is, and also what your opinion is on the overall security posture of this application. Yeah? Yeah, get to the point and be concrete. Don't be fluffy, by the way. Nobody reads that. <laughs> so I have seen sometimes reports, you know, um, SQL injection, the standard SQL injection description, nobody will read that, yeah? Be very clear about it, be concrete, yeah? So um, that's definitely, um, and if you have, you know, if you want to describe something about SQL injection, then may be very clear then to point to the right, you know, URL, and describe if which parameters and so on, because this is important for the developer later if they if they are going to address this. They need to know the details, by the way, and um, it must be also reproducible. That means that if you provide this information, they need to know also the way how you how you did that. Sometimes they are asking, you know, five times how you did that, yeah, and they can reproduce that. So it's always a waste of time, and it's sometimes boring. <laughs> um, good. And at the end, by the way, you are going to talk to the developers. Yeah? And sometimes they have really hard questions. So it occurred to me that I couldn't explain them at the end in detail. <laughs> so uh, regarding, regarding if you do the reporting, yeah, and um, some idea, because there are already um, you know, standards, description of vulnerabilities or weaknesses um, or attack, attack pat patterns, uh, you may then, I mean, you can reference it in your report, yeah? So um, there are already lots of information available 
uh, which are free available, uh, for example, like the common weakness enumeration. Yeah? We are seeing here improper neutralization of special elements used in the SQL command. Um, it, it means that it could lead to single injection, by the way. <laughs> it's, it's compl it sounds complicated. Um, but this is, I mean, a way of communication. That means if you standardize that, it will be understandable. Um, it will be definitely something to exchange information through different teams, developers, and so on. It will definitely uh, improve the quality of the report. Yeah? You may reference this. You may also reference, for example, the common atta um, attack um, pattern and enumeration classification means there is also a standard for this. You, I mean, you can download them and use them. Yeah? It's just an idea. You don't need to do that, but uh, you can adapt this for you. So, um, yeah. So we yeah we talked also about reporting and scoring. So um, scoring means that when you have identified some issues, some vulnerabilities and it could be ex exploited and now you have to score that. Uh, you need to tell the company, okay, how critical is this at the end? Yeah, because they are going to react to this and they have to invest some money and therefore it's important to tell them how critical this is. So now the journey starts here. Um, again, quantifying you know, the issues is really quite hard and I think there are uh, there are lots of universities worked on that, you know, to find complicated and very long descriptions how you can do that. In most cases, the people, it's just a gut feeling, what they think, it's, it's low, medium or high. But at least you can try, you know, to quantify that. Yeah? And I will just show you, let's say, tweaks or um, two standards here you may use for yourself. One is the OWASP scoring. The OWASP scoring, you see that... Uh, first of all, the risk metrics here, you see that the risk is the product of impact and likelihood. Yeah? And the impact and the likelihood, so you see in the metrics, if you, know, if you combine low and low, it's still low, or if you have a medium likelihood and, um, and low impact, so the, the, the overall risk will be um, low. So this is something you, know, um, you may use, you may adapt for yourself. And, and then you see also, there, is, there are also sheets you can use that and calculate all the risk um, for the likelihood and the impact. So first of all, you go through the likelihood and the likelihood is uh, determined by the threat uh, vector and the vulnerability vector. Yeah? That means um, if there is a vulnerability and if there is a, the right threat, then you may have a high risk at the end. So it means there are some vectors here like what kind of skill level you require you know, for this threat. Yeah, and you also judge about possible motif of the attacker here, then the opportunity. That means that um, this is something um, uh, that um, that you need privilege access or not. Yeah. Um, also, the size of the attacker. Um, then on the vulnerability side, there are some vectors like ease of discovery. Yeah? Is this vulnerability something? I mean, you go to the web page and you just you know type in an uh, apostrophe and then you find out the SQL injection uh, or not. So if it's really easy to, to, uh, to identify um, or how easy is it to exploit? Is it something, uh, is a vulnerability? You need to write a code or something like that. How easy is that? So it means that you have different vectors here. You need to go through it. So it could be, oops, sorry. Um, it could be <laughs> a little bit cumbersome to go through it, but it, it's worthwhile to go through it and familiarize you with yourself. I mean, once you have done it many times, you will do it very quickly because you, you get a feeling for threats, for vulnerabilities, and then you can quickly combine that. So it means once you have identified the threat uh, vectors, the vulnerability vectors, then you have the likelihood, then the sheet automatically calculates the overall likelihood. Yeah? And then you can see the score uh, the, the, um, that if it's, if, if it's in a range between zero and three, it's low, and if it's be, uh, between three and five, it's medium. So you see that uh, the likelihood is determined, and then the impact. The impact is very interesting here with OWASP. You have, on the one hand, the technical impact. The technical impact means what is the um, you know, impact on, um, on integrity, if the integrity is lost, uh, or if the availability is lost, or if the data is disclosed. Yeah? What is the estimation of impact here? So this is just a technical um, impact. 
But on the other hand, the managers are most likely interested in the business impact. So what does it mean at the end? So um, if system goes down or if there's hacked, something like that, um, then they would like to know what is the financial damage, what is the repudiation damage. That means that if it's in the press for one day, two days, three days, um, also um, do we violate some compliance requirements? Yeah, for example, data privacy. Um, so that means that they would like to know what is the overall business impact. So that means there's again a calculation, it's the average. Um, in, in this example, we see it's low and um, the overall impact and the um, um, overall likelihood, low, medium. So we have, uh, we would then be, a, let me look at <laughs> likelihood is medium and low, it would be, um, a low risk at the end, yeah? So you need to do that for each of your findings, by the way. Okay, good. It's almost done. So OWASP scoring is one, uh, let's say one approach here. There is another approach here. It's, it's the so-called common vulnerability scoring system. Um, you may see that when you have go, gone through some uh, vulnerability descriptions, a uh, certain score, yeah? So this is all also standardized. Um, the, the vector um, has a calculation between, you know, some base vectors, time and environmental vectors, but let, let's skip that because there are already some good calculators for that, yeah? So if you, for example, go to the page and then you can just play around, get a feeling, so how certain, you know, um, uh, figures are calculated, yeah? Uh, just visit the web page and, and have a look. Uh, by the way, the, um, the link, it will take you to the version tool, but since July 2015, um, there is a new version of the um, CVSS. It's version free, um, it's extended, um, much more work for you to calculate, but um, just, just go ahead and you know, uh, play around. It's, there are calculators, there are standalone calculators, there are um, calculators on, the, on, on, the, on different websites. Um, you can easily use that. There are also Excel sheets to calculate that. So I will just skip this. So, so the, last, the last slide is about the remediation. So if you do pen testing and then you deliver the report, at the end, if nothing happens then, then the pen test has no worth at the end. That means that if you do some pen testing, if you detect something, then it needs to be fixed. So therefore, all for, let's say, it's, um, you have a, let's say a limited part in the remediation process, um, it must be definitely, um, at, at least from a, uh, from a customer or enterprise perspective, a part, of the, um, a part of the, let's say, testing process. That means that you do the planning, you do the pen testing, and then you have to also remediate. That means that all the suggestions you are making to the company to fix that, they need to be in place. So therefore, again, a new phase starts here um, from issue delivery, that that's something you're going to deliver, which needs to be then uh, evaluated by the developers. Then you get some questions. In most cases, believe me, you get some questions because they don't understand the issue or it was not well described. So, so there is a process for that, yeah? And because this will take some time because um, it's usually between two weeks and several months before everything is fixed. Um, in, in general, you need to, you need to establish, um, you need to establish a process for fixing high issues very, in, in a very short time, even sometimes even, you know, within hours or days. For medium, there may be a grace period of two months and for low, it may be accepted because the risk is very low. Okay, um, again, some best practices, how the remediation should work, yeah? And uh, some examples here, how the, how the remediation process is tracked, yeah? Um, there are already tools for this, for uh, tracking the issues, but at the end, I mean, if it comes to the working level, it's Excel. <laughs> so Excel seems to be always somehow handy. <laughs> You managed to listen to me for more than one half hours. <laughs> Thank you very much. So.